Welcome once again to our Oxford Brain Diagnostics guest speaker series. Uh, by way of quick introduction to Oxford Brain Diagnostics, we're an Oxford University spin out with a method for uh, analyzing brain MRI based on cellular structures. Uh, we're working towards a clinical diagnostic tool for early detection of Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases, uh, which is intended to be used by uh, clinical services and drug developers for clinical trials. Uh, so that's a little bit about us. And we're joined today, I'm delighted to say, by Dr. Eric Seamus. Uh, Dr. Seamus uh, has well over two decades experience overseeing clinical trials of neurodegenerative disease. Uh, he was clinically trained, uh, I believe, Eric, at the Indiana University School of Medicine and subsequently, subsequently went on to found the Movement Disorders Clinic at the same institution. Uh, he was also a founding member of the Alzheimer's Association Research Roundtable and uh, was on the steering uh, committee for the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, which we featured uh, previously in our guest speaker series when we had uh, Mike Weiner talk to us. Um, Eric worked with Eli Lilly for almost 20 years and since then has been uh, uh, doing various things, of course, but Chief Medical Officer for Acumen Pharmaceuticals, uh, about which I think he will say a little bit more today. So as an imaging-based company, we're, we look forward to discussing uh, the value of biomarkers, including imaging in, in, in uh, the drug trial space. Uh, and I think the subject of your talk, Eric, is uh, innovations in AD trial design using uh, Acumen's Intercept AD trial as a case study. So over to you. Great. Well, Great. thanks for Thanks for the introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, it was a very good introduction and exactly what I what I want to do is use some of this acumen experience as an exemplar really for um, you know how development plans for Alzheimer's can be done in general. So just in terms of my disclosures, you already heard that I'm the, the CMO for acumen, but also do some uh, other consulting um, a bit. So, for some of you may be familiar with this, but I just wanted to uh, lay out uh, some of the basics about uh, Alzheimer's pathology and uh, this A-beta that, that we'll talk about. So A-beta is formed from a larger protein called the amyloid precursor protein or APP. So that uh, amyloid precursor protein is cleaved by beta secretase or base and then a second uh, enzyme, gamma secretase, um, leaves at a different point. And then the piece in between is this A beta or amyloid beta, which, which causes all the problems, we think. So those A betas can do a couple of different things. They, they can just uh, add to uh, an existing plaque, and we'll go into that a little bit more, form plaque or they can form uh, what are called oligomers. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that too. So, um, but the A-beta peptide is, is really just 42 amino acids. So it's not very big. Um, one of the things that's become more clear in, re in more recent years is that um, there are several different forms of A-beta or amyloid plaque. I think in the past, People talked about the amyloid hypothesis as kind of this monolithic thing, um, but it's really not. So you can target the, these A-beta monomers uh, with a drug. Um, you can uh, target the oligomers uh, with a drug, including the antibody that the acumen has. Um, these protofibrils, uh, so oligomers are soluble, protofibrils are uh, can be soluble, the smaller ones are. Um, there's a drug that recently was approved um, called lacanumab that actually targeted these protofibrils. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then finally, you can target plaque. Now, the plaques themselves, well, first of all, they're insoluble. Um, there's not really a lot of data that the plaques themselves are toxic, but they are a reservoir for the toxic species um, that basically that a beta is having an off rate coming off of the plaque. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so again, I haven't got to focus too much on, on this acumen antibody, but, but a little bit just because I'm going to be talking about the development plan later on. Um, so we get the question, what are these oligomers? And it's anywhere from two to 200 of these a betas and they're they're hooked together uh, in a particular way. And, and this uh, uh, image here, the um, 
D-terminal ends of the peptide are blue, the N-terminal ends are, are uh, orange, uh, the C-terminal ends are hydrophobic, so they stick together. Um, and so that this would be a trimer, three of the A-betas, this is an A-teamer uh, on the right. Um, and these are globular when you look at them on AFM. So it's a little bit different than protofibrils, which have this linear structure. And then these are the fibrils that make up plaque, and they're they're very linear. So again, it's it's a little bit of detail, but um, you know the devil's in the details uh, a lot of times in terms of drug development. And so uh, a, a drug, uh, in particular, a monoclonal antibody that targets one versus another of these species can have really different characteristics. Um, this this uh, cartoon really uh, talks about what I've already said in terms of the monomers and oligomers and, and, and then plaque, but it reminds me just to point out that there are other good mechanisms that are being investigated now uh, in the clinic uh, in terms of Alzheimer's. So tau is the other um, protein that's uh, uh, intracellular, but it, it, it's deposited in uh, with Alzheimer's pathology uh, and there's a it's early days but there's a number of studies uh, that target tau and then there are some things that uh, are not amyloid they're not tau uh, but there are other mechanisms some of these involve uh, inflammatory pathways which are probably part of the disease so there's a number of kind of interesting uh, approaches which are not amyloid and, and not tau which are are in the clinic now um, just quickly, um, we, we tend to categorize these Alzheimer's drugs as either symptomatic or disease modifying. Um, the symptomatic drugs are things like the cholinesterase inhibitors that came out in the 90s. And so th the disease overall goes downhill. It's not completely linear, but, um, it, but it, 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 it obviously progresses. With these symptomatic drugs, you get an improvement, but you don't really change the underlying disease progression. And so once you've got your improvement, it, it's just a parallel downhill course. And if you stop the drug, it'll go back to uh, where the placebo would be. For these disease modifying drugs, it's a different it's, it's a different sort of effect. So if you start the drug, what you're really doing is changing the slope. And so the longer you run the study, the bigger the delta that you get between placebo and drug. Now, one thing that doesn't change is the percent slowing. And so for a lot of these disease modifying drugs, we talk about it, it slows it by you know, 25%, 30%, whatever it is. Um, the world of Alzheimer's drug research has been a little rocky, as you may know. Um, there were uh, a series of uh, protease inhibitors, either for gamma secretase, which, which we showed you um, cleaves APP, um, or beta secretase. And um, these were, you know, good attempts, um, but it turns out that these gamma secretase inhibitors, or gamma secretase has a number of different substrates besides APP, and when you inhibit it, um, it actually your, your cognitive decline gets a little worse. And so some of those other substrates are probably things that your brain needs. And, and um, that's why that, that class of drugs didn't work. For the base inhibitors, there's a lot of enthusiasm for these. Now, base also has other substrates, not as many as gamma secretase. There was a period of time when everybody was just sort of convinced that these base inhibitors would work. But when these read out in 2018, 2019, and they were negative or actually caused a little bit of worsening, it was a rough time for the field because people had really bet on these base inhibitors. But at the same time, um, you've got these monoclonal antibodies that, again, that target sort of different forms of A-beta. Um, solanizumab actually ended up having uh, trends that were very consistent not a big enough effect to be useful as a, as a drug in the clinic, but it did move the needle the right direction. Like Hanamab, uh, this is when the phase two data came out, uh, that looked uh, uh, very promising. 
Antinuramab has had some uh, interesting data. Now they just will come back to this, had some phase three data that, that um, had trends, but not enough. Atacanumab is its kind of own story, but it, it uh, seems to have an effect and we'll come back to that. Denanumab uh, is another one. Atacanumab and denanumab target plaque and, and that in a phase two study seems to, to work. And now for lecanumab, we actually have this um, accelerated approval for it. Um, and I'm, I won't spend a lot of time on this. So this is sort of a drilling down a little bit on the timelines. Some of you may have heard about this uh, accelerated approval for aticanumab that happened in 2021. That was following an advisory committee which voted against a full approval, um, but they didn't vote on an accelerated approval. But then in the interval between the two, these, these denanumab phase two data came out. FDA said, okay, if you really get rid of plaque, that, that's a biomarker that's reasonably likely to predict uh, clinical effect, and so they made the decision for accelerated approval, but then CMS said that they weren't going to pay for it. So it's been sort of a non-entity, actually. Um, one of the other really important things, I think, in terms of drug design is that there was a school of thought for quite a while, actually, that if you were going to target some form of amyloid or A-beta, that you had to actually be before uh, people have any symptoms at all. So we now know uh, that you develop plaques 20 years roughly before you ever get any symptoms. Um, and so the thought was, well, you got to be in that window before you ever get symptoms. But it turns out for these drugs that are showing effects, uh, BN2401 is lecanemab. So aducanemab, lecanemab, denanemab. They're all looking at people who either have mild cognitive impairment, MCI, or mild dementia uh, due to Alzheimer's disease. And so you're seeing a drug effect there. The reason why that's important is that the study designs for this pre, these preclinical studies um, are not well worked out, the duration, the size, the, actually even the primary outcome measure. Uh, there, there's just a lot of work to do with the study design. The study design for what's being called early AD, MCI and mild dementia, is uh, much better understood, much more experience with it. Uh, you know the duration, you know the, the outcome measures. And so I think it's really beneficial actually that you don't have to go all the way back to preclinical to show a drug effect. Um, this again uh, is just an illustration of these different monoclonal antibodies and, and how they target different things. So bapinoizumab was really the first and it, it actually binds to a lot of things a little bit, um, but solanizumab um, is, is actually very specific for monomers. Um, denanumab uh, is actually, would say very specific for plaque, gantinuramab targeted plaque. Um, uh, Adahelm or aducanumab was developed to target plaque. Now, after the oligomer story kind of took off, they went back in the lab and said, hey, we, we bind to oligomers too. I'm not sure how much, how relevant that is though. And then lecanumab is interesting because um, it actually binds, it's actually protofibrils. So fibrils are a little bit bigger. Um, now, they seem to get, they have plaque reduction, so it must bind a plaque to some degree, um, but it was really designed to target the, these soluble protofibrils. And then finally, the one that, that I'll talk about a little bit more, the uh, ACU-193, that was specifically developed to bind to oligomers and not to bind to other things, and so it, it's, it's quite selective for these oligomers. Um, this is some recent data that got put together and it get, just gets at the point of, about plaque reduction. And so it turns out, and this is really recent data just last year, uh, late last year from the Gantt-Nurumab studies, um, graduate one and graduate two, they did have some plaque reduction, not as much as they wanted. And these, uh, the slowing of disease progression, this was not statistically significant, but, but the, there were little trends there, but that's not enough to be a useful drug with that amount of plaque reduction. So um, 
so this on, on the y axis here is is the amount of plaque based on uh, PET scans. Um, but if you look at uh, three of these studies, one with aducanumab, one with uh, denatumab, and then uh, uh, lecanumab, uh, uh, the clarity study, if you, for the ones that really take plaque almost down to zero, then you start to see more slowing uh, of disease progression. And so if you are going to target plaque, you really do have to get rid of it. Um, when you target plaque, you get a, a, an adverse uh, effect called aria. And so this is, there's plaque around blood vessels. If your antibody binds to that plaque, it pulls the plaque off and, and you get some leakage, either just uh, transudate fluid or else either micro hemorrhage or in some cases macro hemorrhage. Um, and you can see on this slide, the different antibodies have it to, to different degrees, but it is important for solanezumab, which doesn't bind to plaque, just binds to monomers. It doesn't have any uh, uh, aria. So you don't, it's not that every uh, monoclonal antibody causes aria. Um, so here's a, a paper that we had published recently, which summarizes the clinical plan. Uh, for ACE 193. And again, I'm going to use this as an example, but a lot of the concepts here uh, you could use for a variety of different drugs in development. Um, one, another paper that I think is important, uh, it was a really a thoughtful collaboration, is how you make go, no go decisions in drug development and in particular in Alzheimer's disease. So that's something that you really have to be rigorous about. Um, to, to pre-specify how you're going to make these go, no-go decisions. And, and that's true for drug development in general, I think. Um, just a little bit about this antibody, ACU 193. I said it, it's very specific for um, uh, uh, oligomers. It really doesn't bind to monomers. It's a over 500-fold selectivity. Uh, even if you add a lot of uh, monomers to the mix, it also, um, if it binds to plaque, so the green here is plaque, and if you look at the little bit of binding of ACU193 to the plaque, uh, it, it's right at the edges. And so it's kind of hard to know if it's actually binding to the plaque a little bit, or there's this cloud of A-betas around the plaque, which can form oligomers that could just be in the cloud. So if it binds to plaque, it doesn't seem to bind very much. Um, so we're doing a trial right now that's a phase one trial, and the, the patient population uh, is early AD. Again, this mild cognitive impair impairment or mild dementia due to Alzheimer's, um, and we know it's Alzheimer's because you have to be amyloid positive based on a PET scan. Now, for this phase one study for us, um, you know, because it's a phase one study, safety and tolerability is always the primary. We need to see the right PK. We need to see target engagement, which for this antibody means that in spinal fluid, you need to show the antibody bound to oligomers. Um, but then I'll show you some additional uh, interesting things that um, just in case we might get a little bit lucky in our phase one study, we, we could uh, have some evidence of uh, efficacy based on some biomarkers. So here's the overall design of the trial. It's Pretty typical SAD MAD, um, except that we overlapped the, the cohorts a bit. So the first MAD cohort was triggered after the SAD cohort at the same dose. But in a lot of ways, it's a pretty typical SAD MAD. Um, again, I said for us and our go no go decision, we need to have the first three here safety and tolerability, PK, evidence of target engagement. And if we get those three things, we can go on to a phase two, three study. And I'll talk a little bit about that too. Now, again, the extra things that we're doing, we're going to look at things like uh, CSF and, and now plasma, phosphotal, things like neurofilament light. Those things will be important for the phase two, three study. I think uh, in, the, in the MAD part of our phase one study, people get three administrations of the, of the antibody. It, it's a little hard for me to believe that three administrations will affect those things, but, but we'll look mostly so we get experience 
with the assays uh, before we go to the phase two, three. Uh, but the other things that I'll show you a little bit about are some additional clinical measures uh, based on some uh, uh, computerized cognitive testing, and then uh, a way to use MRIs to look at cerebral blood flow. So if we get, we don't really expect to see those, they're very exploratory, but if we would see an effect, and, and there is a school of thought, these oligomers bind to synapses, and if after you know, two or three administrations of the antibody, you pull the oligomer off the synapse, you might actually get almost kind of a symptomatic uh, effect and some improved uh, cognitive function. So uh, this, this uh, cognitive, computerized cognitive battery, we worked with a company called CogState uh, to develop this CogState. This is pretty much what they do is computerized uh, uh, testing. Um, and you can see it's a battery. It, it, it um, tests several different cognitive domains. But the nice thing about it is it only takes a half an hour um, and you can do it repeatedly. Um, we'll have, we have all the usual Alzheimer's scales, the, the CDR, the ADOS COG. In a little phase one study, it's, there's so much variability in those, those scales that there's just no way I think you could expect to see an effect. But um, with this computerized testing, there should be less variability. You can do it repeatedly and if we're lucky, um, we might again uh, actually see a little bit of a symptomatic improvement in one or more of these tests, but that would be a home run. But we didn't want to miss that if it were there, so we put it into the study. Um, and then the other thing that we we added is what's called our arterial spin labeling, which is a pulse sequence on on MRs. Now there's a long history of literature that, that blood flow is decreased in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and uh, this, this ASL is a pulse sequence that's been around for a while, but the technique has gotten better, the signal and noise has gotten better. And so what we'll do is look to see if there's an improvement in blood flow in these people after administration of the antibody. Again, this is very exploratory. Um, but if we see an actual improvement in blood flow, I mean, that's central pharmacology. In my mind, that's almost as good as seeing a, um, a, a cognitive signal. So, so this is built into the study in addition. Um, the, the patients get MRIs looking for ARIA anyway, so this just adds a, an extra pulse sequence to it. Um, and then overall, um, the way we've set this up is we have our phase one study, which be, because it's a sad man, we really consider it to be a phase 1A slash B with the mad being the B. Um, after that study, we will have an FDA interaction for a, what would typically be called an end of phase two meeting because the next study is a phase two slash three. So the way that study is, is being designed, we're in the process of, of completing the design, but it will start off uh, sort of the size of a typical phase two study. At some point, there's an interim analysis. And at that point, we'll look at all the, the cognitive measures, the clinical measures, but we'll also look at, at biomarkers. And depending on what you get, and we're developing an algorithm to, to do the go, no go decision making, um, depending on what you get, you would either in, increase the size to a size typical of a phase three study, or if you didn't see data that were promising enough, you would run it out as a phase two study. So it's not a futility analysis. You wouldn't stop the study. Um, so at a minimum, you get a phase two. But if you get promising data and you expand to phase three, Basically, what that means is we've gone from a first in human study all the way to regulatory uh, submissions in two studies rather than three. And, you know, we've used a lot of biomarkers and a lot of techniques to, to do that, but um, we, we wanted to be efficient, um, if nothing else, for, for the sake of the patients. We want to get this, if it works, we want to ha have it available at, as soon as possible. So. We've packed a lot into these trials, um, but it's all based on sort of emerging data that a lot of it has just come out within the past 10 or even five years. Um, 
So basically, this is um, where we are, is uh, there is really a number of things that have developed over the past few years. First of all, the correct patient population, I didn't go into this, but if you look at people, especially with MCI, half of them or almost half of them will have a cause other than Alzheimer's, but we can now with amyloid PET testing, find out who actually has the has Alzheimer's. So that's been, been a big advance. Uh, we have patients in the phase one studies because we can get more relevant uh, information, both for safety and for um, some of the biomarkers. Um, again, I talked about the importance of these go, no-go decisions, um, and those can be applied first to go from our phase one to a phase two, three, and then secondly, for in the phase two, three, at the interim, do you scale it up to a phase three or not? So I think with that, um, I'll go ahead and uh, finish. Um, and if I can figure out how to stop sharing, I'll do that. I think I stopped Perfect. there, right? Yes, you did. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Eric. That was a very nice uh, overview, both of the kind of underlying logic and biology and some of the history of uh, uh, trials in this area, uh, as well as some more specific details about the about the upcoming uh, trials that you're working on. So I think at that point, it's a good opportunity to open up to the rest of the team for some potential questions. Uh, please raise your hands or draw attention to yourselves. I think I saw Jed immediately raise his hand. Go ahead. Yeah, um, quickly, based partly on the, the last slide that you showed with the summary and the fact that you talked again about um, uh, the problem of MCI participants who don't have Alzheimer's and having amyloid PET in there to confirm that. Um, I just wanted to hear your thoughts about um, the need for a tau marker as well uh, and your thoughts on perhaps the uh, use of um, tau PET in um, the Trailblazer ALTS 2 study to define a kind yeah. of uh, a sweet spot, if you like, or kind of Goldilocks zone of people who are not not too little or too much. Exactly. No, it's a really interesting question. Um, so, so the two hallmark pathologies of Alzheimer's, one is amyloid plaque, and the other is is neurofibrillary tangles or tau. And what uh, Lily elected to do in the the um, the nanomap development plan is not only did they require people to be amyloid positive, but they also required them to be tau positive because if if you're tau positive, you're gonna have a more decline, which makes it easier statistically to show a drug effect, but they also didn't want them to have too much tau and be too advanced where these drugs wouldn't work. So it was this Goldilocks approach where you, you know, had to have some tau but not too much, just just the right amount. Now, you know, and I've I've, I've talked to some of the Lilly folks actually and about this, and you know, from a scientific standpoint, I, I think it's just brilliant. You know, I mean, they that's how you find exactly the population that that you would you would like to test. And they had a positive phase two study where they actually hit on a, on a clinical measure the IDRIS. My question is, from a practical standpoint, how would that play out for clinical medicine? I mean, are you really going to get two PET scans, you know, first an amyloid PET scan and then a tau PET scan, and then the tau PET scan has to have just the right amount of tau? Now, their screen failure rates apparently are very high. I don't know, 85%, you know, something like that. So from a clinical medicine standpoint, how would that play out? So people come into your office, and again, you get these two PET scans, and and only 15% of the people who you work up actually get the drug. I, it mm -hmm. those are the questions that I have now. Having said that, the these plasma biomarkers are improving, you know, day to day almost. And it, it I suppose it's possible that rather than having two PET scans that you would do um, a blood test uh, that would be consistent with amyloid plaque as well as a blood test that would be consistent with with tau um, so that would be a phospho tau um, plasma test but there's a lot of work to do there i mean the cutoffs aren't 
very clear for that. For amyloid, uh, there's one test that's available that they, they do have some established cutoffs. But for phospho tau, that, that work still needs to be done. So anyway, it's, it's brilliant yeah. science. I'm just not sure how practical it is. That's very interesting. Thank you. Jed, uh, just wondered if you want, would you comment any more on the on the idea of the fluid tower markers and where they stand in development at the moment? Um, oh gosh, you put me on the spot a bit. I mean, we've we've had interesting <laughs> comments in some previous um, uh, guest speaker uh, Q and A sessions about the issue with 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 fluid tau markers. Some of them seem to relate almost more to amyloid PET than they do to tau PET. Um, I guess that that can be a challenge as well. Um, I don't know if that's something you want to comment on. The, the, the another another potential follow up I I guess could be uh, whether you see a role for for MRI in the the kind of screening process as well. You know, given that you're using quite innovative MRI sequences. Well, yeah. So um, yeah, this gets into the the details, but it, it, they're important. It it is interesting that. Uh, PTAO, especially I think 217, seems to track better with plaque than it actually does with tau pet. And it may be that you see phospho tau coming out in a plasma before you can see tangles based on a PET scan, mm. which would be a good thing. But this is all hypothetical at this point. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, agreed. And that's why I invited the further comment, Jade, because I knew you had a couple of thoughts uh, around that. Um, but also, uh, yes, and also on the MRI point, of course, you know, since people oh, yeah. are likely to have to have the MRI scan, as you said, Eric, anyway, for a lot of the sort of safety and ARIA expectations, mm -hmm. all this all, all screening in that sense, as it were, uh, I think that what you're doing about uh, adding the odd extra sequence, which usually doesn't take too much extra time since people are already there lying in the scanner and right. can be quite quite passive about it, which is important in this kind of uh, condition, then that, you know, that that I think is a real advantage if we can find ways to do that. And as you know, we're looking at microstructure, so we, we hope to contribute to that kind of assessment as well. So questions from others, uh, Omar. Hi, Dr. Seamus. Thank you very much for that interesting uh, presentation. It's Omar here. Um, given given where the oligomers are binding on the cell structure, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how you actually, maybe in phase two or phase three, decide to measure the improvements in synaptic signaling? Well, yeah, so great question. Um, so because, uh, and I didn't spend a lot of time on this, but be, because there's good evidence that these oligomers do bind to dendritic spines at, at, on synapses. Um, you know, one of the things that we've talked a lot about looking at is uh, things like, uh, as a biomarker, things like synaptophysin or SVA2, you know, things that, that measure synaptic density, essentially. Um, now that um, will be more than likely part of the phase two, three. Again, we, we are sort of in the midst of planning that, but that's going to be high on our list of biomarkers to look at. Thank you. Very good. Any any further questions from the team? Uh, make yourselves known if I can't see everybody all at once actually on my screen. So is that Ian? Hi, uh, yes, thank you so much for your great talk. Um, so, you know, you're, you're saying that sort of one of the strengths of this uh, approach uh, is that um, uh, it's easy to do it later on. And, and you're sort of talking about um, uh, the, the issues that arise from having too uh, restricted um, a patient, sort of segment, patient segment. Um, but surely it is the idea that these drugs would be used much earlier. Um, and But would we have to have a trial where truly early you know, you know, 10 years pre-symptomatic patients were actually in the trial before we would be allowed to use these drugs. Yeah, I, I think you definitely would. And those, there are studies that are ongoing. And, and so even though I said, you know, that there's some complexity to the study designs there, those things are being worked out. And it's the best possible thing you could do is prevent any cognitive decline, right? So sort of fast forward, I don't know, 
five years, maybe 10 years, maybe hopefully less. But if we've got good plasma biomarkers, you know, that could become a screening test like you get your cholesterol tested. And, you know, if a screening biomarker was positive, then maybe you would go on and have a PET scan. Maybe, you know, maybe the plasma biomarkers get so good you can skip the PET scan. I mean, people have talked about that. Um, maybe, and, and I should have commented on this too, an MR with, the, you know more about this than I do, but with these new sophisticated techniques that are being developed, I mean, that could certainly, you know, play a role um, uh, in an evaluation. So when you're thinking ahead, um, these things really could be, um, you sort of get into literature on colonoscopies and mammography and that kind of thing. And um, so, you know, fast forward, I think that could actually be an incredible advance from a public health standpoint, right? Um, because uh, Alzheimer's is a long and expensive disease. And if you could, you know, delay or prevent people's cognitive decline, you know, that's just a huge win for society. Um, so anyway, but you have to do the trials to prove that it works in that population. On the flip side is what happens for people who are more advanced? And, and that's a little thorny, uh, more thorny in a way uh, because the trials are done in this, this MCI plus mild dementia population. My guess is that payers will only pay for it for people in that uh, part of it. Now, these drugs... You know, it's unlikely they're going to stop progression, right? It'll just be slower. So at some point, you'll go to moderate dementia, say, and then do you keep the drug going? Do you stop it? it it's a, I think it's an individual decision because at some point, and this is a little bit like cancer too, at, at some point you've progressed enough that you don't want to slow it down anymore. You know, it, it just doesn't make sense for people who are at advanced stages of the disease. But exactly when you get to that point, I, in my opinion, that should be decided by uh, by the patient, the family, and the physician. Um, but I think that there's a reasonable chance that the payers are going to, you know, maybe have an influence on when you stop the drug. Thank, thank you. And just to just follow up on that point, um, we, we've had various speakers who have talked about there being a tipping point. Uh, it's been referred to as the tau um, yeah. but But there's yeah. a point at which uh, the mechanism uh, accelerates greatly. Is that something that you believe in? Um, you know, because it seems to me that, that they could require two very different treatments, uh, one, you know, before that and one after that, or it may not even be possible after that. Is that something that you believe in? Well, yeah. So, yeah, this gets into the the details and but they're, the details are important. So again, hypothetically, if you have somebody with plaque but no tau, um, you might just want to target the plaque. You, you don't need a, a, a tau drug, whether it's a monoclonal or, or whatever it is. Um, now, by the way, um, these oligomers actually seem to trigger tau phosphorylation so if you just have plaque, and this is in, in my sort of acumen view of the world, but if you just have plaque and you target the oligomers, you might prevent that uh, tau phosphorylation and the tau catastrophe that, that happens after that. Um, but yeah, then once you get to a point where you have some tau, then a tau therapy, probably in combination with some sort of A beta amyloid oligomer, whatever it is, uh, would make a lot of sense. Thank you. Very informative. Good. Thanks. Next. Yeah, Michaela. Hello. Um, thank you very much for your talk. On the subject of um, treating people early enough, you mentioned that you've recruited people with um, MCI and um, some of them might not be AD, but you have tests for that, testing for um, amyloid. Do you think that having um, MCI patients that will not progress to AD despite having uh, the, the underlying pathology would be a problem in the trial? And do you have um, methods to predict which ones and when they might um, convert to AD? Well, yeah. So um, one of the ways you can do that is to look for tau, even in 
you know, with somebody with MCI, and that will make them more likely to progress. I, I know actually because I worked with on solanezumab and in some of those studies, what we found is even when you required people to be amyloid positive to go into the trial, if you were, and this is a sub study, but if you uh, had people who were tau negative, they didn't progress, and they actually had mild dementia. They weren't even MCI. So you know, predicting who's going to decline would be a really good thing to do. But then again, you get into the practicalities of it. Are you going to get a tau PET scan on, on everybody in clinical practice? Um, now, if you could, and again, this is all hypothetical at this point, but if there's a plasma biomarker that predicts decline, then that would be great. You know, you could, if if you had somebody with MCI, even if they were amyloid positive, um, I suppose if you don't think they're going to progress based on some other biomarker, you could hold off on treatment. Although, to be honest, I mean, speaking as a neurologist, if I have somebody with MCI, cognitive impairment, and they got amyloid plaque, I'm going to want to do something about whether it's the plaque itself or oligomers or protofibrils. You know, I'm going to want to go after that. But, you know, you could make the argument that if we've got good predictors of who progresses and who doesn't, and you're not going to progress, then why get these IV infusions of antibodies? Thank you. Good. Any more questions? I see Bob Good. Yeah. Um, Mario, I think I saw first. I don't know who, who put their hand up first, but Mario, go ahead. Can't hear you, Mario. Hear me now? Yeah. Yes, I can. Yes. Eric, can you hear Mario? So Barely. Talking about the interaction between uh, this uh, recent uh, AD drug and other uh, drug. I mean, uh, the the last uh, clinical trials uh, show interesting results uh, about the the, the new. Uh, the new drug recently developed, but in the real world, uh, in the clinical practice, uh, uh, often the patients with the mild dementia already use other uh, drug, for instance, a uh, drug for vascular. Uh, so did you have any comments about the potential interaction between uh, uh, vascular uh, treatment and uh, the novel uh, uh, AD uh, drug? Thank you. Well, yeah, so there's a couple of questions there. One is for vascular in particular. I mean, it is possible that you've got some of your cognitive impairment is due to vascular and some of it's due to Alzheimer's. I mean, in other words, you can't have fleas and ticks. Um, but I think it's sort of the, the other question is for people who um, uh, are diagnosed, uh, Typically, they'll be on symptomatic drugs. I, I didn't get into this, but usually going into these trials, at least for people who are uh, mild dementia, 75, 80 percent of the time they'll be on some symptomatic drug, which just becomes part of their background therapy. So one of the other tricks that people have kind of learned over time to do in these trials is, you know, it's OK for people to be on symptomatic drugs but they have to be in stable doses and you don't want to actually change the dose or stop the drug during the trial because that's going to be a confounder. Yep. And um, it, as it turns out, even in an 18-month study, it, uh, you can do it. I mean, every now and then you have somebody, for whatever reason, they really need to stop a drug and you know, you obviously have to let them do that. But um, but these symptomatic drugs, you just have to be careful that they're in stable doses and they stay that way through the whole study. But most people in the studies are on some sort of symptomatic drug. Okay, yeah, you you mean, uh, for instance, uh, patients with memantine, just uh, to have yeah. an example. Yeah, okay. great. Thank you. Good, ja Jamie, do you want to go ahead with your question as well? I'll try again. So it's about ARIA. And the when uh, so you mentioned it and uh, you discussed it in your presentation about um, for the the plaques tend to have more aria associated um, with treatment. Do you tend do you, do you think this is going to be more of a problem for 
plaques and do you think this is going to be completely em eliminated by focusing on oligomers or do you find that this might be something that's a problem for for these kind of treatments as well well yeah so that's uh, uh a thought you know certainly um it, it's interesting that um uh well, first of all, the ones that, that target plaque and, and are intended to target plaque, so that would be um, aducanumab and, and denanumab, um, they have the highest rates of aria. Now, lecanumab is, is kind of interesting because it was developed to target protofibrils, but they actually get quite a bit of plaque reduction. But the aria rates are less with lecanumab than for aducanumab and denanumab. Now, whether that's because by targeting protofibrils, they just shifted equilibria um, to reduce the plaque, and somehow that gives you less aria associated with it. Well, it's one possibility, and I don't think anyone really knows, but it just goes to show that, you know, these different monoclonals don't all behave the same. And you just, one of the problems is that for people who say, well, monoclonal antibodies for Alzheimer's are just one class. Well, they're not. I mean, each one has its individual characteristics. Now, again, you know, denanumab and aducanumab are pretty similar, but it's different than lecanumab. And, you know, we'll find out about ACU-193. Um, my actually, the question I was thinking about, uh, Eric, was um, coming back to I ha when I, I had a, a look at the paper, one of the papers that you you mentioned about the trial, um, and around obviously the idea of the oligomers being the sort of the most toxic mm -hmm. uh, stage uh, of of the of the, of the amyloid. Um, so I, I was thinking, I noticed that you'd, you'd said also just here in your in your presentation that. There was some hope, some expectation that the um, cognitive efficacy might be might be greater for this this intervention. And I wondered, is the is the thinking around that to do with the idea that you, you know you, targeting that stage is should be the most beneficial um, and and alleviate or you know the most of the knock on effects, or is there something more specific to do with cognitive uh, sort of uh, results that, that that you're thinking of? Yeah, no, that, that's a yeah, great question. Um, so for this, the way we've designed the overall program is that we're just looking to slow disease progression. And with with ACU193 that, that targets oligomers, again, the oligomers seem to induce uh, tau phosphorylation, so they take you down that cascade. And so I think it's reasonable to think that AC193 could slow disease progression. And, and that's kind of our default case. But best case scenario is that, again, because these oligomers sit on synapses, and, and by the way, they, they disrupt long-term potentiation LTP, and you can mm -hmm. prevent that with the antibody. Um, so because these things are sitting on synapses, with treatment with, with the AC193, it could essentially kind of pull the oligomers off of the synapses. You start to have better synaptic function, and you would almost have a symptomatic improvement in addition to the disease modifying qualities okay. of it. So that's like best case scenario. The mm. studies are designed and powered and, and whatnot just for slowing disease progression. But if you get that kind of symptomatic effect, I mean, you really hit a home run in my view. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah thanks. I, actually, that, that's that's good. I, I sort of overlooked the long-term potentiation effect. That's that's really interesting. Um, uh, uh, yes, because I was wondering if if the thinking was around the idea of toxicity being somehow sort of a reasonable correlate or reason reasonably linearly correlated with with cognitive function and dysfunction. And I wasn't I wasn't sure that that was likely to be to be the case. It seemed more likely that it'd be quite non-linear. You know, it would have to pass the tipping point a bit, like we've been talking about with mm. with. The, the the neurochemistry as well um but uh i'm not aware of anything suggesting that it would be linear with relation to, in relation to toxicity but that's very interesting I see, I see your point about that sort of local effect on synapses uh certainly emphasizes the interest in the synaptic densities and and, and those sorts of measurements yeah. you mentioned yeah 
Great, thanks. Um, yeah, other questions? Anybody? Are there got more questions? Terry? Yep. Your computer works, doesn't it? So we can. It should do, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. So I think it's a slightly more general question. I, when I was reading the the paper about the the trial design, you're saying you're unlikely to see any cognitive changes during the the the, the phase one trial. But I just wonder if the participants, if you track them later to see what happens, if anything happens, or is the assumption that they then get included in the next phase of the trial normally? Um, yeah, w one thing that we have done uh, is we don't, if people are in the phase one trial, we don't exclude them from the phase two, three. Sometimes people will do that. I don't think mm. it's fair to the patients for one mm. thing. So anyway, but in even the, the MAD, they have three administrations of the antibody. So uh, for two of the cohorts, it's every four weeks. For one of the cohorts, it's every two weeks. Um, but then we'll get cognitive testing after that. So, you know, I suppose there could be some delayed response. It's, you know, a little hard to say. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, there will be cognitive testing sometime after it varies with the cohort and whatnot, but after they've had their third dose. OK, thanks. Good, we're almost to time, uh, folks, but uh, does anybody have any other further? Questions? I, good, I was going to say I've almost sabotaged it by saying we're almost to time. People getting a bit nervous <laughs> to, do, to do the last question, but not Omar. Go ahead, Omar. No, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, Dr. Sievers, just one. Quick question. Uh, it's with regards to the patient population and the design and, and the recruitment, maybe perhaps in phase two and phase three. Has uh, Acumen or you, yourself or any of your colleagues from the scientific community thought about looking at uh, Acu193 in relation to the Osaka mutation? Uh, patients who obviously have low amyloid load at a very young age and therefore high levels of oligomerization early on and do still suffer memory loss. Right, right. Um, yeah, we, we've we've talked about that. I mean, you know, the, those sorts of, um, I mean, not only is that uh, a genetic autosomal dominant, it's a very specific type. And so you could do a study like that, which would be interesting. I think logistically, you know, it, it would be a little bit hard to put together. And, and you know, you're going to have a small sample size. Yeah. There's just, you know, no way around that. Um, but um, one other thing that, that we and others have talked about is um, in Down syndrome, you know, people with Down syndrome now live much longer than they used to. And because, you know, it's trisomy 21, they, over, they have three copies of uh, amyloid precursor protein, so they oversynthesize the beta. Um, basically, my understanding is that all these people they develop the pathology of Alzheimer's in kind of late 30s to 40s, start to develop cognitive impairment, say in their in their 50s, um, and and basically then have this downhill course. Um, so some people have actually said, well, that's just a form of Alzheimer's disease, and and it is the same pathology essentially. But that's a it's actually a big problem for the community, uh, the Downs community, because you know these people function pretty well in group homes uh, until they start to get demented, and then they may have to move back with their parents, who at that point are pretty elderly. So it's a big problem for the Downs community. So I think that you know, for whether it's AC193 or, or some other drug, I think you're going to see uh, more studies uh, done in patients with, with Down syndrome. Dr. Seamers, thank you very much, Dr. Seamers, for your time today. I think that we've all enjoyed uh, the time that we had for Q&A, actually, as, and, as, and thank you for your presentation that allowed plenty of time also for that. So um, I'm sure we'll talk again, but uh, 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 for our guest speaker series, uh, thank you, thank you for taking part. Well, thanks very much. Just a great discussion. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Thank, thank you, you very much. Bye. Bye. See you again. Bye.